Okay, in this lecture, I want to uh, move from talking about the total Lagrangian formulation to the updated Lagrangian formulation. Uh, and we're going to talk about the conservation equations. So we talked a little bit about the difference between the total and the updated. Um, and I know that there's a little bit of confusion uh, out there about it. Um, es essentially, both of them are still Lagrangian formulations. So we're still tracking material points, right? These aren't Eulerian uh, um, formulations. They're Lagrangian, right? So we're tracking the material point. The difference is that in the total Lagrangian formulation, we're taking the derivative with respect to the material coordinate, x, and when in the updated, we're taking the derivative of our quantities or the integrals with respect to the current coordinate C. Okay. But we're still tracking the material point. That's what our, our, our concern is. So, uh, these are equivalent formulations from, from that perspective. Okay. And we'll show that, uh, in a couple lectures. Let me write that down. Okay. So the primary difference, uh, between the total Lagrangian and the updated Lagrangian uh, formulations is that the total Lagrangian formulation uh, takes derivatives and integrals with respect uh, to the material coordinate x and the updated Lagrangian uh, takes derivatives and integrals with respect uh, to the current coordinate, the Eulerian coordinate C. Okay. Um, so that's, that's really the only difference. Uh, and then because one is working in current coordinates and one is working with respect to, um, uh, material coordinates, we also have a different, uh, definition of both of our deformation measure as well as, well as our stress measure. Okay. Um, okay. But, but let me remind you also that both the total Lagrangian and the updated Lagrangian include all kinematic nonlinear effect, nonlinear effects due to large displacements, any effects due to large rotations, and any effects due to large strains. The proper choice, uh, uh, in, in the case of which one you should choose depends on the constitutive laws that you're using and, uh, which might, might be more computationally efficient. Okay. Okay. The, uh, so I'll just, I'll just remind you too, that the other significant difference when you're using them, it doesn't affect the solution. It just means that, uh, you need to have the, the, uh, the you need to use the right measures for both stress and strain. So uh, I'll just say that the stress measure and the strain measure uh, will typically be different for the total and updated Lagrangians, right? So remember that in the total Lagrangian, right? We use the nominal stress P, right? And we use the strain displacement, uh, the partial with respect to uh, the material coordinate X. And in the updated Lagrangian, uh, we're going to use the true stress or the physical stress, the Cauchy stress sigma. Uh, and and in this particular um, instance, we're going to go ahead and use something called the, the velocity strain um, or the deformation rate. And, and so uh, I'll call that uh, D comma x, I'll define that for you in a minute, um, but this will be the velocity strain. Okay, we could define another, uh, a strain kind of like uh, what we did here, but this is just to show you another, another type of formulation, okay? So let's go ahead now and, and go to developing the governing equations. Okay, so let me just say, as we develop the governing equations, we're going to select sigma and the velocity actually variable, okay? Right, sigma and velocity, although we could have used u if we wanted, right, uh, to formulate the total Lagrangian. This is going to, instead of leading to the principle of virtual work, uh, because we're using velocity instead of displacement, this is going to lead to the principle of virtual power, okay? So, so be looking for that. So now we can go ahead and define the, this deformation rate, right? So just like what we did with the case, in the case of, um, the total Lagrangian, where we took, we defined a, a, a strain, a, a a displacement rate that became the strain, right? The partial of the strain with respect to, to X. We're going to define the, the deformation rate, right? As D sub X is going to be now, instead of the partial of U, it's going to be the partial of V, since that's the term we wanted to use, uh, with respect to C. And I actually should maybe change this notation so that it becomes less confusing. I'll put a, put this as D C. Okay. So remember it's a, 
partial of the velocity with respect to C. Uh, and so this could also be written as V comma C. Okay, let's call that equation one. So that's our deformation rate. That's going to be our measure of deformation in this case. Okay, a couple things to note. Okay, the derivative in equation one is with respect to C and not X. And then also I'll just say sometimes equation one or this DC term uh, is sometimes called the velocity strain. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and consider our conservation and balance laws. And conservation of mass is going to be first. Uh, it's going to look exactly the same as it did in the total Lagrangian case, right? We have in the, we always have the density times the, the Jacobian, right, which is the ratio of deformed volume to undeformed volume must be equal to the initial density. And we could, in the 1D case, expand that out and say rho F, where F is the deformation gradient, times A, the cross-sectional area, must be equal to rho naught times A naught. Okay? Let's call that equation 2. Right? And just note that this is identical uh, to the total Lagrangian formulation. Nothing changed. Okay, in the case of the balance of momentum, uh, we write something similar, right? Except we have a different stress measure, and now we're going to write it as A instead of A naught, so the current area, the cross-sectional area, and now we have sigma instead of P. Uh, and then we're taking the derivative, remember now, instead of with respect to X, it's with respect to C, right? Uh, plus uh, rho A B is equal to rho A v dot right again you could derive it in the same way but but i think i can just give it to you uh, at this stage so i'll just say for this term i'll just say note the similarity uh, with the total lagrangian term which which looked like a naught times uh, p comma x right so just just a different uh, derivative term there and a different stress measure okay uh number three Conservation of energy. Okay, looks something very similar, and now it's rho w int, right? So that's the, the rate of internal work is equal to uh, sigma dx, right? It's that conjugate term. Uh, and then if you want some heat terms, it's uh, q xi comma xi, uh, and then uh, plus rho s, and I should make this d term, I should make it uh, d xi right? Let's call this equation four. And then uh, uh, note what's the similarity here uh, with the total Lagrangian form, right? The total Lagrangian form hat was uh, PF dot, right? So now it's, uh, there, it's still a rate term. This is our velocity strain, but it's still a, the, the velocity term contains a rate. And it, instead of being multiplied times our nominal stress P, it's now our Cauchy stress sigma. Okay, hopefully that's straightforward. Okay, L let me also define these terms for you. Uh, Q, C, right? Uh, it represents the heat flux. And the S term uh, represents a heat source or sink. Okay, so there's our balance equations, our, our, our conservation equations. Now we'll define our constitutive law. So we could define the constitutive law as follows, right? So we could define it in the the non-rate form. So now sigma, and let me let me be careful as I write this, right? This is sigma x and t, right? So I'm still looking at the stress of this material point, right? It's going to be equal to call it s, and I'm going to superscript sigma d to remind you what my um, what my uh, fundamental stress and, and displacement measures are. And then this term becomes D C. It's the it's a derivative with respect to C, but it's it's a function of X and T, right? And then it could be anything or it could be then an integral if you want, something like a viscoelastic solution might be. Now we have D of C of X and T bar, right? Where um uh so let me just say Right, dt bar, right, where t bar is less than t. And you could similarly write a rate form for that. 
right? This is a, just a generic case. Again, function of x, that's important, right? Even though we're looking, we're taking derivatives with respect to current coordinates, the, the stresses are still defined at the material positions. That's what makes it a Lagrangian, okay? Uh, so that's going to be equal now to S. I'm going to put a subscript T to remind you this is now a, time, a rate term. Uh, sigma D goes in the top still. Uh, we could still have DC uh, of X and T bar. Uh, I should also make this uh, a T bar up here. And uh, Sigma, same thing of now, it could be still X uh, and a T bar, right, it's etc. right? It could be, I should put some dot, dot, dots in there. It doesn't have to be any of these, or it could be more, okay? T bar less than or equal to T, okay? And I also just wanna uh, call that equation five. I also just wanna say that um, I know that these look a little cryptic, okay? So don't, don't panic just yet. We, we're gonna have a section where we talk about different types of constitutive laws for nonlinear materials, okay? So uh, you're probably mostly just thinking, all I know is Hooke's law, that's fine, don't panic, we'll, we'll get there, okay? So I just wanna reiterate, I've said it twice, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna write it down now. All of the, the variables in equation five are functions of the material coordinates x. But I will remind you that we can always transform the current coordinates back to x, right? Right, v via the equation that says the material coordinate is equal to the inverse of this mapping, uh, phi inverse of c and t, right? That, that mapping. Now we don't, we can't always necessarily find that mapping, but that mapping exists. Okay. So similarly, uh, even, remember, we're in the Lagrangian form. We're still gonna, so we're still gonna write our boundary conditions uh, on the Lagrangian coordinates, okay? So the boundary conditions. Uh, are given as follows. We'd say there's a velocity boundary condition that'll be at x and t, right? And that will be equal to some uh, v bar, right? Some prescribed uh, velocity term, x, t, evalu uh, uh, applied on the portion of the boundary that has a velocity boundary term. And then we could say also that, um, uh, n sigma evaluated at x and t is going to be equal to some attraction x t uh, bar evaluated at x and t on the traction part portion. Okay. And in this case, for the 1d case, this will be just plus or minus one to indicate which, which direction uh, that we're, which, which side of the 1d we're on, right? So a positive stress on the left-hand side is going to point in the left-hand direction, but on the right-hand side, point in the right-hand direction. Okay. Call this, call these uh, collectively equation seven. I'll make a couple notes here. So even though the boundary condition is applied on the velocity, uh, it's equivalent to the displacement. And, and that's simply because it's related to displacement via a time derivative. I'll also just like to note that in the 1d case, those traction boundary terms uh, can be related to the total Lagrangian boundary conditions in the following way. We can say that T bar of X times A, right? Remember, traction is a per unit area, so now this is going to be the force, uh, must be uh, T bar X naught, right, in the, in the, um, uh, the total Lagrangian case uh, times A naught, right? So this would be the total Lagrangian boundary condition, and this is the updated Lagrangian boundary condition. Okay, let's call that equation eight. So, and, and this is this is sort of uh, uh, similar to the total Lagrangian where we had, uh, everything was either a, a displacement or attraction based boundary condition, everything had that. So uh, similarly, in this case, okay, the, the boundary on which the velocity is defined, that portion, in union with the boundary on which the traction is defined uh, must be the total boundary of the problem. And uh, the boundary on which the velocity is defined can never be the same any part of the boundary where the traction is defined. So we'd write that as the boundary with the velocity intersected with the boundary of the traction is identically zero, right? That This is the sort of the statement that uh, that uh, is required for, for our um, 
uh, essential and, and uh, natural boundary conditions. Let's call this equation 9. So if you remember in the total Lagrangian case, we talked about continuity conditions. We still have the same thing. Uh, it just says that our force continuity must be maintained. Okay, so the internal continuity conditions are as follows. Right, we wrote the jump condition in this fashion. So we had before, it was P times A naught. So you can guess this is going to be sigma times A. Right, so in the interior, sigma times A, that jump uh, it must be zero, which means that that force term is continuous. Call this equation 10. And the final um, piece of the puzzle that we need are the initial conditions. Okay. Uh, the initial conditions are going to be given by, right, we'd say that we define sigma again on the Lagrangian coordinate x. So is going to be equal to s some uh, sigma naught, right? And then we'll have a velocity initial condition. Let's call these equivalently equation 11. Okay, in this formulation, the initial displacements are assumed to be zero. Okay, so that's the governing equations. The next thing we want to talk about is how do we put them in the weak form so we can discretize them and, and create a finite element solution. Okay.